There we go. Yeah. Okay. Hi. I'm trying to figure out technology here. <laughs> no worries. There's always an awkward, awkward phase when I bring people in. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, good morning. Good morning. And uh, welcome to the 10th Niche Conversation with Season 3. Um, I'm Jessica DeWitt. I'm one of the editors here at the Network in Canadian History and Environment. And today I am joined by Barbara Rousseau. Uh, do you want to tell us more about yourself? Um, well, on my bio, um, I'm a grad student at uh, University of Prince Edward Island <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, in the Master of Arts in Island Studies program. And previously I have, um, well, I just completed a Bachelor of Integrated Studies at UPEI, but way back I have a degree in math from the University of Waterloo. So cool. this is a bit of a shift. Yeah. <laughs> I, was always I, love in, that. I was always interested in the environment, but, um, you know, kind of followed the tr more traditional paths into IT and mm -hmm. uh, was a project manager for 20 years in uh, Ottawa. So, um, but then... Um, in uh, 2016, 2017, I had the opportunity to acquire some land on PEI and uh, <clears throat> built a cottage out at St. Peter's Harbor, which is a subject of my, my mm -hmm. blogs. And uh, then I decided I want to go back to school. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and then after I'd finished my, my BIS, it was like, well, what now? And I'd worked with uh, Josh McFadgen in the Geo Lab and um, mm -hmm. seen the aerial photos and that really fascinated me as to how you could see the changes over time in the landscape from the aerial photos that we have on the yeah. uh, cool I love that I love a winding path you know all of us all of us start at, you know one place and end up somewhere completely different I think most of us do um and I love that uh yeah so this past year you wrote two pieces for us and both of them we're in the top five most popular posts of 2022. So whatever you're doing, Barbara, it's working. <laughs> I think it might be just that I live on, uh, I live on PEI. <laughs> so I, I think there's a lot of interest in social media and the, and the topics I wrote about, so. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, work with what, you know, your, the strengths of your topic, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about your second piece from last year, which was our most popular piece from last uh, from 2022. And it was such quantities of sand, surges and coastal change on Prince Edward Island. And you wrote this in the aftermath, aftermath of Hurricane Fiona. So I thought we would start off today by, um, you know, what was uh, your experience of Hurricane Fiona? And can you describe um, its impact on PEI? Uh, well, you know, first off, I, uh, we, we'd already been through a hurricane or post-tropical storm or whatever it was called, labeled at that point with Dorian three years ago. So, you know, I, I'd actually spent that out in the cottage. That was my first semester on campus at UPEI. We had just got to the cottage and um, it's pretty freaky out there on the North Shore when you don't have any trees buffering and such. And uh, even with Dorian, like for instance, the National Park lost a lot of trees at the Cavendish campground. Um, so they were still cleaning up from that. And apparently Maritime Electric went, well, we need to trim the trees so they won't uh, come down mm -hmm. as much. So you could see mm -hmm. all along the main roads where they've been trimming trees. So, you know, we had several days warning of this and they were actually pretty accurate with the warnings, but they were saying like, Oh, make sure you have enough food for food and water for three days. And we're thinking fine, because that's how long we were without power before. And um, and then the, just the wind started picking up in the night. And it's like we're, we were actually like we have a guest bedroom in the basement on the south side. So we were actually kind of sheltered from the worst of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like like a train roaring by continuously <laughs> um, and then at three o'clock the power went out and um, so we were getting up checking our sump and you know making sure that it was draining properly and uh, and I looked out and it's like is there a tree like our tree looks shorter in the backyard <laughs> so it turned out it had fallen back on the power line mm. and then in the morning you could see the um, this is an old pine tree and in the morning you could see the pole bouncing because of course the winds continued for another day. So we could, we could see as of the morning, the damage and we could hear it initially, like we could initially still communicate mm -hmm. 
Um, but then the, um, the transmission powers all went down and we even had problems with communication. Um, so it wasn't until kind of we emerged the next day, the, on, on the Sunday, that they started the cleanup and we started to really see the scope of the, of the damage. Wow. So, so um, then, uh, I, then we went out. Um, well, of course, the other thing was that that was really scary was the next door neighbor had a tree in the front yard that came down on her roof um, and just missed her sleeping by inches or she had just gone down got up for some reason to check on things yeah. um so there we had she had this tree perched on her house that if it rolled off it would end up on our house and uh behind us we had our tree bouncing on the power line uh so we knew nothing was going to happen for a while so we went for a walk in the neighborhood and like all the access to the main roads was cut off um you, you couldn't get in and out of the community um so we didn't get out until Monday um, when they cleared the main roads. And then we drove out to St. Peter's Harbor and uh, to assess the damages there and seeing all the trees down. And the people were lining up for gas because mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the gas companies, the gas depot the, did not have um, generator backups. <laughs> so they couldn't actually get the gas out to the... Um, uh, to the communities. Uh, so there's all sorts of lessons learned. Um, and so then we got into the, the harbor area and they were cleaning out the trees luckily so we could get down to the beach. And then we kind of saw the, the scope of the, the scope of the damage, damage that like we'd already been starting to see pictures of um, a PEI National Park and the, like the before and after pictures. And it was the same, it was the same at our beach um, mm -hmm. just in terms of the dunes just sheared off and now we have we, now we have a sea view because we faced the dunes but it was the past that particular dune was high enough but when it was cut back like suddenly we went one day hey now we can see the ocean because we couldn't before oh that's fascinating uh yes. yeah the witnessing that kind of landscape change like within you know several hours yeah that's you know you don't experience that very often and when it when it happens it's it's pretty wild i don't know if i personally have like like i've been where there's been a lot of like tree damage mm -hmm. like when i lived in a forest like we would have these like wind shears that would come through and it was almost like a tornado but like kind of different you know just like take off the trees and okay. you know even that kind of like landscape um that like fast landscape change was jarring, you know, to the same. Mm -hmm. um, well, one, one of the things with PEI also was kind of a lesson in environmental history too, because we have, especially on the east end of the island, we have a lot of spruce that's mm -hmm. only come up, like it's the first, it's the first successor and has only come up, you know, in the last 40 years since the farm lands have been abandoned. Yeah. So it was just reaching the end of its life anyways. Uh, we have um, a resort down the road and they had huge damage because they were an old farmscape and uh, the owner said, you know, I expected some of the trees to come down soon, just not all at once. Um, yeah. So it's, um, it, it's pretty, it's kind of a, a confluence of events that, um, as far as the treescape is concerned, um, but the, the beach, it, I mean, it's always changing. We, we had already lost um, six, uh, six feet or so, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. two meters in, uh, in the winter, because now we don't have the sea ice as much. Last winter, we didn't get as much sea ice or it came in later. So it came in after the snowstorms. And so you didn't have the buffer of the sea ice protecting the dunes. Um, so it's kind of a cascading effect. And I just yeah. wonder how long, how many more events like this between the winters and the hurricanes that we can handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you've touched upon it, but I thought we would just, you know, briefly, if, if people don't know, like, if people aren't familiar with coastal ecology, like, what is the, like, in the role of dunes on the coastline of PEI? Um, well, it's interesting because if you look back, uh, one of the things I did was um, look back at, on the St. Peter's Harbor website, St. Peter's Harbor Lighthouse Society website, mm -hmm. um, they've got some heritage and one of them was some stories of the 1923 storm 
So this was almost like the hundred year storm because it, they turned out to be equivalent. Yes. Um, but at that time, you know, they didn't think about the dunes at all. Um, they were just, the sand was annoying because it basically silted up the channels and they had to, to work around, around it. And there was really nobody left at the time of year when the hurricanes came in. So in 1923, you didn't see much about the dunes. But today we start to realize that there's habitat there. The dunes that I'm talking about are actually owned by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Mm -hmm. They were donated um, to by the McEwen family. Um, and uh, uh, they, um, so now that it's, it's an aesthetic, it's, you know, they've come up, um, people like to like to go to the beach. Um, so there, there's that aspect, but there's also a habitat created behind them. Like, especially at the Greenwich dunes, you have these marshes and these freshwater ponds behind. Um, so it's habitat for wildlife, it's habitat for people. Um, and I think they play a really protective role that we don't appreciate enough <clears throat> um, because our community wasn't damaged. Uh, aside from the trees, um, mm -hmm. you know, and a, sh a few shingles blown off, but we didn't get storm surge. Um, and you have, you know, the poor uh, people and the, the Hebrides uh, development on the west end of the island where their cottages were washed away. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't even find them so I think sometimes we don't appreciate the um, the role of the dunes uh, mm -hmm. quite enough or like we think about it as you know oh it's aesthetic and people like to climb on it and then get you know get get annoyed when we say well you shouldn't climb on it because that makes them weaker yeah. but I mean yeah. it blew out mostly where there were paths um, so um, you know I don't know enough about the, unless I'm only still learning about the ecology of it. Um, I'm looking at it from a historical perspective, but that's kind of the, the two, um, some of the major ecosystem services, if you will, yeah. um, that they provide. Cool. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's, that's valuable to know that the first person perspective of also you know, witnessing the ecology and being like, you know, people don't, don't, don't uh, appreciate this role that they play um, enough. And, you know, all these interweaving factors and, you know, how fascinating that is that, you know, paths, just, just paths can weaken them, right? And, oh, it's, it's so, it's so rich in historical analysis and, and whatnot. And, Anyways, I'm rambling, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I thought we'd, you know, wrap up by, you know, your, what your post does really well, in my opinion, is connecting the past, the present, and the future of PEI through these sand dunes and this coastline. So I wonder if we could wrap up with you just kind of discussing, you know, what does looking at these sand dunes, how does it help us make the connection through time? Well, I, I think I kind of came about it the other way in mm -hmm. terms of like I moved into the neighborhood and um, slowly started to realize the benefits of it. But the other thing, I mean, I've only been there going to the dunes regularly for five years now. Yeah. And I have just, it's so dynamic, an environment. It really teaches us about dynamic um, social ecological systems mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how um, we, can, we can influence things. Even in my first post, um, part of the underlying message was that humans had created, you know, these structures to help control the sands. And what ended up happening was the sands collected around the breakwater and eventually meant that they had to close the harbor. So there's these unintended consequences that we can see in just a few lifetimes mm -hmm. or just the day-to-day -day changes. We'll walk the beach um, like after Hurricane Dorian, there wasn't, didn't seem as much damage. It seemed striking, but it wasn't, it was about the equivalent of what we saw in the winter storms in term. And then it just, the sand comes right back in and starts all over again. So there's such a dyna dynamism to the dunes that you can, you can see, you can e easily see what can happen over time. And, and, and like a lot of what I'm learning in island studies is islands, um, are kind of harbingers for um, what can happen um, mm -hmm. and what is likely to happen. So the dunes are, are, I think, really illustrate some of the effects of the decisions that humans make 
ha have made over time. And that's what I'm interested in looking at because I can see day to day, week to week, year to year, um, some of the changes and, you know, whether, whether they're effective or not, or, um, you know, somebody said, well, the dunes will take care of themselves. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of messages to be teased out that are kind of, um, could be prophecies or, or, you know, just um, having awareness uh, that this is kind of the first line of defense for the island. Uh, there's a lot of attention to me to, you know, sea level rise and the effects of flooding. Um, the Climate Change Center has done lots of trends and um, predictions of flooding, um, but there has been less attention paid to the effects of severe storms and the overall changes in the circulation and um, the natural protection that we have and how can we um, reinforce this natural protection or should we, should we let the dunes migrate as they will? You know, if we try mm -hmm. to stabilize them, um, I'm, I'm still looking at this, but if we stabilize them, are we reducing their resilience? I'm really interested in the, the resilience of ecosystems and um, how, how can we make, can, how can we help the dunes be re resilient to the changes that we've created in terms of climate change. So, um, you know, it's so by looking at the past, we can see what they did and what the effects are now, because it's very, uh, as I said, very dynamic. You can see the effects, especially through the aerial photos we've had since 1935. Um, and then kind of project that for the future, but consider that the change is all that much more rapid now. Um, and uh, so it's, you can get really in knots <laughs> over it, but uh, I, I, I think it's just fascinating every time you walk the beach and, mm -hmm. okay, well, you know, today the, the sand is exposing the breakwater or exposing, actually there's some uh, wood that people say are from Acadian piers, fishing weirs, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the breakwater was built, that juts out into the bay was built, you know, 100 and, uh, 150 years ago. And same with the lighthouse, you know, why do they endure? Um, mm -hmm. And the lighthouse is probably because it bolted to the, the other breakwater. Um, but you know, you get questions like that. Why, why did, you know, one lighthouse endure, but the other one didn't? Because um, there were two originally, or what didn't endure somewhere else mm -hmm. um, and had mm -hmm. to be rebuilt. So um, I, I think it's, um, and I'm really fascinated with what, um, some previous settlers left behind in terms of records and, and what was life was like a hundred years ago and how we used, how, how they saw the landscape um, or didn't, <laughs> you know, because they were too busy uh, trying to survive. Um, and the other neat thing about, well, it's, it's a bit of an aside with, with the first post, but the other neat thing about St. Peter's Harbor is when you look into it, it actually reflects the history of the island as a whole, right from the, um, Enigma artifacts that were um, found on, on the bay at one point to the Acadian settlement. It was the um, it was the uh, largest settlement on the island with the Acadians, um, and uh, mm -hmm. to you know the the um, the British overlords and the Scotch uh, settlers and um, it, and how they modified the land and how they ha had to the land modified them or they have they had to make adjustments yeah. <laughs> so um cool. yeah I, it's it's all it's all intertwined and you can go down so many paths but uh, mm -hmm. i'm trying to keep a focus <laughs> yeah, i understand that <laughs> i i i love this this focus on dynamism and it, it's making me think of like in my own work with parks i've looked at how people like once we conserve once humans decide to conserve a spot in their mind, nature should then stay the same, right? We make a park and it should be, when we protect that space, then it should be that way for the rest of time. And when the park, you know, if the effects of climate change on the trees or, you know, you know, the budworm comes in and kills trees or, or there's a storm or what have you and it changes the landscape, we don't, we don't do well with that we don't do well with accepting the dynamism of nature um uh we, psychologically i think um and uh i think the sand dunes are very are, are kind of you know 
rip that apart. They don't allow you <laughs> to really be nostalgic, right? Because it's constantly changing. They don't allow you to kind of hang on to this idea um, quite as well, even though I'm sure people do. Um, anyways, that's what's what your work is making me think of at the moment. Yeah, well, there's a big question for me anyways that comes up in some of some of the courses is, especially on PEI, kind of like England, like what is natural? Yeah. Um, 300 years ago, it was 90% covered in, in Acadian forest. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, our, the spruces are not particularly natural by the history yeah. of, by the, the, the history of it. But even the dunes, the dunes outside our cottage area, that was flat beach, mm -hmm. if you look at the old maps. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's an article about Greenwich dunes that, you know, it was destroyed by a massive overwash that then took 50, 60 years, and sorry, in the 1923 storm, that then took um, 50 to 60 years to build up. And the natural use of it before had been for grazing. Um, so then, the, you know, the park's trying to preserve the dune, but the dune keeps trying to migrate. <laughs> um, so, you know, what is natural? Um, if we're trying to preserve the stability of the dune, that maybe that's not natural, but that's because we've built up close to it and we need its protection. Um, so there, there's all this, it's kind of, and it gets into environmental philosophy is to, you know, what are we preserving? Um, is it for humans? Is it for animals? Even, even the animals, you know, looking at what, what's natural in terms of the wildlife on PEI because humans extirpated bears, for instance. Um, and so, and like the, the foxes, I really like the foxes, they're really cute. And they like living in the, you know, along the edges of these abandoned fields. Um, but then they get into town to try and avoid the coyotes and, and people start feeding them and then they overcrowd and that upsets the balance of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a theme running through, through anything I'm doing in research is like, well, what is natural? What are we trying to preserve? Yeah. Um, so yeah, exactly. Oh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> talking about this for hours, but that was great, Barbara. I really enjoyed talking to you about you know your experience living in PI and how that connects to you. Uh, it's also a very interesting story about how how you come to a research topic, right? I think a lot of people get are interested in that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So thank you for joining me today, and I recommend everyone check out uh, such quantities of sand. Um, as well as the other one, which the name of it is, is escaping me at the moment. <laughs> I can't even remember myself. Uh, uh, it was published in July, I think. Yeah, yeah it was about, um, sorry, I've got it bookmarked here. Sure. Um, uh, the Disappearing Harbor. Yes. The uh, how the, how the um, as I said before, how basically um, trying to build the structure to preserve the harbor ended up mm -hmm. with the sand catching, catching on it. And eventually they couldn't use it anymore and had to move to Redhead Harbor. Yep. But it's really fascinating how the boats have to zigzag even then out of that mm -hmm. because of the sandbars. So it's all like, it's repeated elsewhere. It's all about longshore drift, right? Mm -hmm. it, it erodes somewhere and it deposits it somewhere else. So there's all these instances. Trackety Harbor, uh, Trackety Bay, um, I think, is exactly the same. I was like there, oh, there at the new restaurant, and um, I think it's Trackety, and was um, looking, and I said, "Well, there's a breakwater there." And then I went and looked at the at the old maps, and went, "Oh, well, it used to be open water there. <laughs> That's why the lighthouse is there." So it's a similar story where it closed in, um, and, but in that case, they just moved the harbor in, inwards. I, I don't don't know if there was as much issue, but uh, it's you know. All, all along the north coast, you, uh, mm -hmm. even out to the uh, uh, the proposed Tiduamke, um, uh National Park Reserve that the Lennox Island is and Parks is trying to um, uh, introduce. Mm -hmm. um, you know the Hog Island Sand Hills, basically they were called. So, um, and I'm I'm sure it's like along a lot of other coasts too. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll post the links to those articles in our stories. Okay. And thank you for your time, Barbara. Have okay. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Now I have to figure out how to get it out. <laughs>